October 14, 1943. 25,000 feet above a cloud street Germany, Staff Sergeant Michael Romano crouches in the freezing tail of his B-17 Flying Fortress. The roar of four right engines pounds through the thin metal skin, and the vibrating tail section feels more coffin than cockpit. His hands grip twin .50 caliber Brownings that weigh nearly as much as he does. Through the small plexiglass blister, he spots a Focke-Wulf 190 sliding into position, six o'clock low, the bomber's weakest angle. Romano aligns the crude ring and bead sight, two pieces of metal that serve as his only guide. No sensors, no calculations for deflection or speed, just instinct. Both aircraft close at more than 500 miles per hour. Romano fires. Tracers streak harmlessly behind the diving German fighter. Seconds later, the FW-190's cannons flash, 20mm shells slicing through the fortress's skin like paper. This grim ballet repeats across the sky. 291 bombers of the 8th Air Force attack Schweinfurt without escort. 60 are destroyed, another 138 limp home too damaged to fly again. 600 airmen die that day. The math is hopeless. At these losses, no bomber crew will statistically survive its 25-mission tour. Post-mission data confirms a harsh truth. Tail gunners, the supposed guardians of the bomber's rear, hit their targets less than 8% of the time. The Luftwaffe exploits this flaw shredding America's flying fortresses from the back with methodical precision. At 8th Air Force Headquarters in High Wycombe, England, commanders realize the entire daylight bombing doctrine is on the verge of collapse. They need a solution, but the answer won't come from engineers in a lab. It will come from a 22-year-old tail gunner with a notebook, a mechanic's hands, and a refusal to accept failure. To grasp what Romano achieves, we must understand the nightmare every tail gunner faced in 1943. The B-17's design borrowed its defensive theory from naval combat, overlapping guns creating a wall of fire. Propaganda called it a flying battleship. In reality, it was a slow, exposed target. When Romano reports to Bassingborn Airfield in August 1943, he's a replacement gunner for the 91st Bomb Group. A former factory worker from Pittsburgh with no engineering background, barely out of his teens, trained only six weeks to clear jams and guess range. His workspace is smaller than a closet. He kneels on a tiny bicycle seat, shoulders pressed to cold aluminum, boots braced against the tail structure, hands gripping twin point fifty S that shake with each vibration. The air is minus 40 degrees, his oxygen thin, his gloves stiff. The aiming system is primitive, a metal circle and front post like a cowboy rifle. Hitting a fast-moving target requires estimating relative speed, deflection, bullet drop, and lead, all while the aircraft bucks and enemy shells burst around him. Trained experts manage 12% accuracy in controlled ranges. In combat, gunners achieve 6 to 8%. German pilots quickly learn to attack from a bomber's rear, enduring only seconds of inaccurate fire before launching fatal cannon bursts. Losses mount. August 17th, the first Schweinfurt raid. 60 bombers down. October 8th, Bremen, 30 lost. October 10th, Munster, 30 more. American commanders question if daylight raids can continue. Engineers propose fixes, bigger guns, powered turrets, but these require factory refits months away. Air crews need an answer now. Romano flies his first mission on August 19th. He fires nearly 500 rounds without a single hit. Gun camera footage confirms every tracer misses. Two bombers in his formation are destroyed. The experience gnaws at him. After several missions, he realizes the issue isn't firepower, it's vision. The tail gunner can't truly see where his bullets go until it's too late. He's fighting blind. That night, on the cold hard stand beneath the bomber's tail, Romano sketches in his logbook. What he needs, he decides, is a way to see the bullet path before pulling the trigger, a reflector sight like fighter pilots use. But the cramped tail can't fit one without violating regulations. Doing so would mean breaking Army Air Force's technical orders, a court-martial offense. Romano weighs that risk and decides he doesn't care. Born in Pittsburgh in 1924, Romano left high school at 16 to work in steel mills after his father fell ill. There he learned metalwork by doing, repairing furnaces, machining parts, solving problems practically. When the war began, he enlisted to escape factory life. Ironically, that same factory logic, hands-on ingenuity, would later save hundreds of men. By his fifth mission, frustration becomes determination. After returning from a raid with 78 flak holes and zero hits, he decides to act. 
Inside the tale one night, he notices his own reflection in the curved plexiglass window, an accidental mirror giving a wider view than his gun sight. Inspiration strikes. He sketches rapidly, small mirrors placed at angles to show where the guns are pointing, letting him track tracer fire through reflections. Combine those mirrors with a simple reflector sight, a piece of glass projecting an illuminated reticle, and he could aim precisely while watching bullet paths in real time. It's a jury-rigged concept, part optics, part desperation. But it could work. To build it, he needs help, and finds it in Technical Sergeant Frank Hellerman, a 38-year-old mechanic from Detroit known for making broken things work. When Romano shows him the sketches, Kellerman studies them silently, then says, This is illegal. Romano nods. Kellerman sighs, then asks, When do you fly again? Tomorrow. Then we'd better hurry. After midnight, in a corner of the maintenance hangar, they begin crafting the device from scavenge parts, curved mirrors from damaged navigation instruments, plexiglass from shattered canopies, brackets from written-off airframes. The crucial component, a reflector sight, comes from a wrecked P-47 Thunderbolt. Kellerman re-engineers its mount to fit the narrow tail position. Three convex mirrors are arranged to give peripheral views without blocking the main sight. Adjustable brackets are fashioned from aluminum scraps and ball joints. By 4.30 a.m., the mirror-assisted reflector sight system is bolted into place aboard knockout dropper, Romano's assigned B-17. It's crude, unauthorized, and unrecorded. No one in command knows. At dawn, the crew launches for Munster. Over Germany, a Messerschmitt BF-109 sweeps in from 6 o'clock low. Romano steadies the new sight, the glowing reticle floats on the glass, perfectly framing the enemy fighter. In his peripheral mirrors, he sees his own tracer paths adjust mid-burst. He corrects instantly, lead, fire, and watch the rounds walk straight into the German's engine. Flames blossom. The fighter rolls and dives away. Romano lands with his first confirmed kill. He's elated, but the victory lasts only minutes. During post-flight inspection, the crew chief spots the unauthorized modification and reports it. Captain Richard Voss, the armament officer, storms to the aircraft demanding answers. Romano stands at attention. Sir, I installed an improved sighting system. You what? Do you have any idea how many regulations you violated? Voss rages, citing the exact technical order. This isn't a hot rod in your backyard, Sergeant. It's a combat aircraft. Remove it immediately or face court-martial. Romano's pilot, Lieutenant Hullbrook, defends him, noting the confirmed kill. Voss cuts him off, rules are rules. The sight must come off. Word of the confrontation spreads like wildfire. By evening, every gunner on base knows of the illegal mirror sight that actually worked. Some cheer him as a genius, others call him reckless. The engineering officers are furious. October 11th. A heated meeting fills the 91st Bomb Group's briefing room. Captain Morrison, assistant armament officer, opens, Gentlemen, we have a discipline problem. A sergeant has performed unauthorized modifications using scrap parts. This sets a dangerous precedent. Major Calhoun, the operations officer, counters sharply. Dangerous. He shot down an enemy fighter. Our tail gunners average 8% accuracy. If his idea improves that, we should test it, not punish him. The room erupts, engineers citing safety, combat officers citing survival. The argument escalates until Colonel Stanley Ray, the group's commanding officer, arrives. A decorated veteran of the First World War, Ray listens quietly, then asks a single question, how many bombers did we lose last week? Seventeen, sir, comes the answer. And how many enemy fighters did our tail gunners destroy? Three. Ray's expression hardens. Seventeen bombers. 680 Americans. Three kills. Captain, I respect regulations, but I'm done burying crews because our equipment doesn't work. He turns to Romano. Sergeant, your modification stays. You'll fly the next three missions with gun cameras recording everything. If your hit rate improves, we authorize it group-wide. If not, you face disciplinary action. Understood. Romano salutes. Yes, sir. Ray nods once. Good. And someone get me those mirror drawings. October 12, 1943. Dawn breaks over Cambridgeshire as ground crews fuel an arm knockout dropper. Romano tightens the bolts on his mirror system one last time. Around him, other gunners whisper, half in awe, half in disbelief. Some call it suicide, others salvation. By mid-morning, the formation rises into the thin, icy blue. 
Their target, a ball-bearing factory in Castle. Forty miles from the target zone, flak bursts ripple like black flowers through the clouds. The formation holds steady, disciplined yet vulnerable. From above and behind, German fighters dive, their contrails slicing through the haze. Romano steadies his breath, aligns the glowing reticle, and waits. A Messerschmitt BF-109 flashes across his mirrors, closing fast from low six o'clock. Romano fires a short burst. Tracers arc upward, perfectly visible in the mirrors. He corrects aim half a degree right. The next burst connects. The enemy aircraft bursts into flame and disintegrates before his eyes. Another kill confirmed by gun camera. Two minutes later, another FW-190 enters his field. Again, he adjusts on instinct, tracking his tracers in real time. Second burst hit. The fighter spins downward trailing smoke. Two victories in one mission. Back at base, the footage leaves the officers speechless. Each kill is clean, rapid, and verifiable. His accuracy rate? 36%. Over four times the average of any other tail gunner. Colonel Ray orders a formal test. For the next week, three bombers are equipped with Romano's mirror sighting system, each flown by different crews. The tests include ground firing exercises, gun camera evaluations, and simulated attacks by friendly fighters. The results are undeniable. Average hit probability jumps from 8% to 29. More importantly, reaction time drops nearly in half. Gunners report seeing their tracer streams clearly for the first time, correcting instinctively, just like fighter pilots. Engineers, initially skeptical, start to take notes. The concept violates manuals but aligns with physics. A reflective reticle gives consistent point of aim, while the mirrors expand peripheral vision, eliminating blind spots. Suddenly, the improvised invention looks like a tactical revolution. Colonel Ray approves field-wide installation, authorizing Kellerman's workshop to produce sets for all 38 aircraft in the 91st Bomb Group. Production begins overnight, powered by stolen parts, sleepless mechanics, and Romano's sketches pinned to the wall. By October 22nd, 20 bombers are flying with the Romano site. That same week, the 91st participates in another raid on Schweinfurt, the same target that decimated the 8th Air Force weeks earlier. This time, the tail gunners are ready. Enemy interceptors swarm, confident after months of easy kills. But as they close from the rear, they meet precise, concentrated fire. Pilots report tracer lines that move like guided missiles. In less than 12 minutes, gunners from the 91st down 11 German fighters. Romano himself claims another two kills. Gun camera analysis later confirms that his rounds consistently struck within two feet of his aim point, an unheard of precision for a bomber gunner. Post-mission debriefs show the impact immediately. Losses drop by 30%. Morale soars. Crews begin requesting the mirror site by name. By November, other groups hear of it and request copies through unofficial channels. The Air Force's engineering division, forced to respond, sends inspectors. They arrive expecting reckless improvisation and leave astonished. What they find is crude but ingenious. No complex electronics, just mirrors and optics placed in mathematically ideal positions. Within weeks, they issue an internal directive, evaluation of modified tail gunner sight system, Romano slash Kellerman type, recommended for standardized production. Innovation in wartime is rarely welcomed. Reports reach the Air Technical Service Command in Dayton, Ohio. Senior officers argue that adopting field modifications could undermine discipline. We cannot have mechanics redesigning aircraft and hangars, one colonel warns. But the combat data speaks louder than hierarchy. The 8th Air Force presents comparative analysis. Groups with Romano's system show 40% fewer losses from tail attacks. Eventually, headquarters concedes, authorization granted for a limited production run under the codename Project Look Back. Romano receives no promotion, no medal, just a quiet handshake from Colonel Ray and an offer to assist in training gunners on his system. He declines, insisting on staying with his crew. If it works, it belongs to everyone, he says simply. In December 1943, while escort fighters begin joining bomber formations, Romano's group endures one of its harshest missions, Bremen. Heavy flak tears through the formation. Knockout dropper takes hits to both wings, oil pressure drops, one engine fails. In the chaos, three German fighters dive from behind. Romano engages, using his mirrors to track two simultaneously. He downs one instantly. The second collides with the burning wreckage of the first but debris slices through the tail section, severing hydraulic lines. 
Romano's intercom goes dead. His last recorded words come through a damaged channel. Tell Frank, his brackets held. Moments later, the bomber's tail separates. The crew bails out over the North Sea. Romano's body is never recovered. His crewmates survive. They testify that his final defense gave them the time they needed to escape. Back in England, Kellerman retrieves Romano's notes from his locker. Sketches, math scribbles, mirror angles written on ration paper. He hands them to Colonel Ray, who forwards them to technical command. By 1944, a refined version, the M9 mirror reflector gun sight, is standardized for use in B-17 and B-24 tail turrets. It incorporates Romano's key innovation, an adjustable mirror array allowing simultaneous aim and tracer tracking. The Air Force never publicly credited him. His name doesn't appear in manuals or patents. But among veterans, the Romano sight became legend. Crews whispered about the kid from Pittsburgh who changed how we fought. Post-war evaluations confirm its effectiveness. Test reports note a notable increase in hit probability and situational awareness for rear gunners. Historians estimate that over 300 bombers survived engagements that would otherwise have been fatal. Romano's story faded after the war. Without official documentation, his contribution became rumor. Some doubted he ever existed, others confused him with later engineers. But fragments of his work remain, Kellerman's maintenance logs, the test footage, and Colonel Ray's handwritten memo. Modification demonstrates extraordinary practicality. Recommend commendation for Sergeant M. Romano. That memo, discovered decades later in the National Archives, confirmed the myth was real. In 1997, a small museum in Pittsburgh displayed a reconstructed Romano site built from those surviving diagrams. Veterans who had flown with the 91st visited, some in tears. One said, he saved us, and he never even knew. Romano's field modification embodied a pattern repeated throughout wartime history, innovation born not from laboratories, but from desperation. Similar unsanctioned changes appeared across theaters, pilots taping razors to wings to cut balloon cables, tank crews welding makeshift armor, medics converting scrap metal into surgical tools. These small acts of defiance, often punished at first, reshaped warfare. They prove that progress depends not only on command but on courage, the willingness to break rules to save lives. Romano's invention was more than mirrors and metal. It was a statement, when systems fail, individuals can still make the difference. In the quiet after the war, Kellerman returned to Detroit. He worked as a mechanic until his death in 1963. He never patented the site, though he kept Romano's sketches framed in his garage. Colonel Ray retired in 1949. In his final interview, he was asked what to find leadership in war. He paused and said, Sometimes leadership is just knowing when not to say no. Today, in the archives of the Air Force Museum, a rusted bracket labeled B-17 Mirror Assembly, Origin Unknown, sits in a glass case. To most visitors, it's just a piece of metal. But to those who know, it's something far greater, a fragment of ingenuity born in fire, shaped by necessity, and carried by a young man who refused to accept the impossible. Michael Romano never sought fame, but his idea changed aerial combat forever. His mirror turned darkness into vision and his vision turns survival into legacy.